He's family friendly, work friendly, and just an overall great guy. He's not afraid to speak his mind and will provide you with that extra burst to make it through your work day. Welcome to the Afternoon Show with Taylor King on the X. Real Rock Variety. Yes, welcome to the Afternoon Show vlog for Wednesday, September 29th, 2010. I want to welcome you wherever you may be viewing today on YouTube or if you're viewing on our website, thexrealrock.webs.com on the Afternoon Show page. Feel free to browse around the site after you watch the video today. And uh, be sure to join me for the afternoon show every weekday from Monday through Friday from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. U.S. Central Daylight Time. All right, let's get things started on what you may have missed today on the afternoon show. Lots of great stuff. Keeping you up to date on what your favorite or maybe not so favorite artists are doing, it's the Day in Rock Report. Do it live with Taylor King on the X. Take it away. Today's quick roundup of the top rock news stories from across the web from antimusic.com. Led Zeppelin legends Robert Plant and Jimmy Page will be guests on In the Studio, the stories behind history's greatest rock bands during the week of October 18th. They will be discussing the 40th anniversary of Led Zeppelin II. Forget the Croc Hall of Lame while they look at possibly inducting LL Cool J. More about that coming up in music news. Rush will be honored with the Living Legend Award at Classic Rock Magazine's Marshall Roll of Honor Awards in November. The Canadian trio will jet to London to pick up the accolade at the event, which will be uh, hosted by Alice Cooper. Speaking of Rush and Jan Wiener Schlockhall, Scott McFadden, or Fadian, who co-directed the award-winning documentary Rush, Beyond the Lighted Stage, tells Entertainment Weekly that the band once again being snubbed by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at next year's induction ceremony is unfortunate. We were hoping a lot more people in the nominating room had seen our documentary, and maybe that would have given them a different perspective on the band, he said. There are just some people that are holding out. Wondering what ex-Red Hot Chili Pepper guitarist John Frusciani is up to these days? Well, in addition to a collaborative album with Omar Rodriguez Lopez of the Mars Volta and a David Bowie cover, the 40-year-old New York native appears to have teamed up with Wu-Tang leader RZA and songstress Sherry Watson, a.k.a. Truth Hurts. A new film traces John Lennon's New York City years, Jam reports. So much has to be told about, or has been told about the Beatles that director Michael Epstein knew he needed to say something different in his documentary of John Lennon, which premiered this past weekend at the New York Film Festival. Yahoo is reporting that Barry Diller, the media mogul who claimed credit for the merger of Live Nation and Ticketmaster, said Tuesday he would resign as chairman of the merged company after a boardroom power struggle with another media giant and director John Malone, that according to a person with knowledge of the situation. And Twisted Sisters Dee Snyder may be joining the Rock of Ages cast on Broadway for a 10-week stint. And that is the Day in Rock report from Antimusic.com. All right, we move forward now to this day in rock and roll history. And born on this day, our lone birthday, Mark Farner of Graham Funk Railroad is 62. Well, what happened on this day? Well, in 1967, working at Abbey Road in London, the Beatles mixed the new John Lennon song, I Am the Walrus, which included the sound of a radio being tuned through in numerous stations, coming to a rest on a BBC production of William Shakespeare's King Lear. John playing organ and Paul playing bass, then completed Your Mother Should Know. In 1969, The Doors appeared at Lincoln Center's 7th New York Film Festival in New York City. In 1971, Gilbert O'Sullivan made his live debut at London's Royal Albert Hall. Also on the bill, Sweet, Dave Edmonds' Rock Pile, and Ashton Gardner and Dyke. In 1973, Grand Funk Railroad went to number one on the U.S. singles chart with We're an American Band, the group's first of two U.S. chart toppers. In 1979, the police had their first UK number one single with Message in a Bottle, the group's third top 20 hit. In 1980, Elvis Costello, supported by the Stray Cats, appeared at the Rainbow in London, England. In 1984, Prince and the Revolution started a two-week run at number one on the U.S. singles chart with Let's Go Crazy, his second U.S. number one and the number seven hit in the U.K. In 1989, while traveling on his motorbike from Los Angeles, Bruce Springsteen called in at Matt's Saloon in Prescott, Arizona, and jammed with the house band. Bruce played a bunch of rock and roll classics, including Elvis Presley's Don't Be Cruel, Chuck Berry's Sweet Little 16, and Route 66. Bruce also donated $100,000 to a barmaid's hospital bill. Well, that was rather nice. In 1991, Metallica kicked off their 138-date Wherever We May Roam World Tour at the Civic Center in Peoria, Illinois. In 2004, Keith Moon's five-piece drum kit, custom-made for The Who drummer in 1968, sold for £120,000, or 215772 American dollars, in London to an American collector, setting a world auction record for a set of drums. 
And also in 2004, The Sun reported that Michael Jackson had a secret fourth child who was now 19. The story claimed that Norwegian Omar Bahati was born after a one-night stand and had stayed with Jackson at his Neverland Ranch in California. And that is this day in rock and roll history for September 29th. All right, we move on now to sports. And the reigning world champion New York Yankees, the Tampa Bay Rays, and the Cincinnati Reds all clinched playoff spots yesterday. The Yankees made the playoffs for the 15th time in the last 16 years with a 6-1 win over the Toronto Blue Jays. They are currently just one half game in the AL East behind the Tampa Bay Rays, who clinched their playoff berth by beating the Baltimore Orioles 5-0. With just a few games left to play, it remains to be seen which of the two teams will win the AL East and which will get the American League wild card. Over in the National League, the Reds made the playoffs for the first time in 15 years, winning the NL Central with a 3-2 victory over the Houston Astros. And as I said on the show, it is nice to have some different teams in there. You know, just not the same ones over and over again. Okay, yeah, the Yankees made it. And, you know, people besides Yankee fans, we all have that hatred for the Yankees. But you know what? It's kind of cool to have other people make it in. You know, kind of mixes it up just a little bit. All right, time now for Celebrity Sleaze, and I know I faded that out kind of fast, but uh, I'm trying to move along here. James Vanderbeek is a father. The Dawson's Creek star and his wife, Kimberly Brooke, welcomed their first child, a daughter, on Saturday. He tweeted early this week, had the blessing of becoming a father over the weekend. Couldn't come close to describing this bliss even if I had 140 million characters. I apologize in advance for any obnoxiously precious new dad tweets that may follow. I'm under her spell. James and Kimberly tied the knot in August at a Kabbalah Center in Tel Aviv, Israel. Khloe Kardashian and Lamar Odom celebrated their first anniversary by renewing their vows. Lamar arranged for Khloe to be blindfolded and driven to the home of music producer Irving Azoff, where the two tied the knot last year, and then they said, I do, all over again. She wrote on her blog, He removed the blindfold and I was just speechless. I was beyond in shock. She later tweeted, I've never been more obsessed with my husband. Elijah Wood is single. The Lord of the Rings star split from his girlfriend of five years, model musician Pamela Racine, who he met on the set of Everything is Illuminated. A source told the Daily Telegraph, Elijah just didn't want to settle down. The last thing he wanted to do was hurt Pamela, but she's pretty cut up about the breakup. Joe Goodice, the husband of Teresa Goodice from The Real Housewives of New Jersey, was released from jail on Tuesday after serving eight days of a 10-day sentence for driving with a suspended license. RadarOnline.com reports that two muscle men were waiting to pick Joe up. The suspended license stemmed from his DUI arrest earlier this year. And Ferris Bueller's Day Off star Jeffrey Jones, this is from the 80s movie, not the uh, potential crappy remake, pleaded guilty to the charge of failing to update his sex offender registration on Tuesday. In 2003, Jones pled no contest to paying a minor for the purpose of taking sexually explicit photos and was arrested last year for failing to register as a sex offender. Now, after entering a guilty plea, Jones has been sentenced to three years formal probation and he must complete 250 hours of community service in a roadside cleanup program. Jones played Principal Rooney in the famous film.